Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Ron Fuller's Studcast. I am the great Brian Last, and it's my pleasure to be with you once again as the Tennessee Stud takes us down that road of wrestling history, sharing his personal tales, his personal anecdotes, and stories that have seldom been heard before with all of us here each and every week on the Studcast. And without any further ado, let's get to the man himself before he rides off on lightning, the Tennessee Stud, Ron Fuller. Ron, how are you today? I'm great, my man. Uh, my pleasure to be here as always, and uh, just uh, really humbled by all the response worldwide. And gosh, just uh, just uh, like you said, lightning saddled up. Uh, I'm kind of holding him up here, you know, kind of reining him in a little bit. But we got another good one today, I think. And uh, this one's going to we're going to cover a lot of topics in this one too. You left us on a cliff last week, Ron. There were so many different things. I can't wait to hear how they are resolved with Southeastern Wrestling in 1975. But before we get there, a couple things. You just made mention of it. We have really gained a lot of new listeners lately, and we want to thank everyone and welcome everyone for coming aboard the Studcast. And especially, I love when I hear from people who say they found out about the show, they have started to listen to the show, and now they've gone back through the entire catalog, the entire archive, and are working their way back up to where we are now because they want to hear each and every story that you have shared on the show. So once again, thank you to all the new listeners. And we want to remind everyone once again, the Super Studcast, Super Studcast number 17, part two is out now with Jimmy Golden for patrons of the Studcast. You can access that show at tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. Only two ninety nine dollars gets you in the door for this amazing content. And part two picks up right where part one left off. We talk continental wrestling. We talk the stud stable. We talk bunkhouse buck and so much more. This is your chance to hear the Welch cousins having a good time on the air. And I think everyone will dig it. Once again, tnstud.com or patreon.com slash studcast. More about that later in the show. But Ron, where are we going to begin this week? Well, I think we're going to start this week with that $1,000 challenge match last week that kind of blew up and uh, ended up in a disaster. And uh, and and we're going to end up with uh, what I how I handled it. You know, basically, it is a 27-year-old uh, first-time uh, promoter and owner of a company. Uh, you know, I got to figure out how to handle something that, that uh, was really difficult. Uh, we're also going to discuss the first two Friday cards of April 1975 and the results of those cards. And we're going to go back to uh, to my commentator problems with Big Jim Hess on Saturday's TV of March 29th and April 5th's television show. Uh, and if we have the time, we're going to finish with the appointment that I will be setting up on April 4th of 1975 for a possible future meeting to discuss the possible move to the largest television station in Knoxville and the national CBS affiliate there, WBIR Channel 10 in Knoxville. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today. And uh, so I think I'm going to just tear right into it. If it's all right with you, Brian. Absolutely. As long as lightning doesn't tear right into it. That's yeah, yeah, my yeah. bigger worry. Well, as long as he keeps me on his back. <laughs> That's, okay. right. That's right. All right. So uh, let's begin today with the brief reminder of last week's studcast, uh, where Dale Lewis was forced by Danny Hodge into stomping the face of his lone opponent on the only $1,000 challenge match of the night of March 28, 1975. Wow. Horrible incident. And, uh, and, it, you know, I described it pretty well, I think, in the last episode. Uh, but this time we're going to talk about how I handle it uh, and how this all goes down and what I'm going to decide to do about it uh, concerning both these guys. So uh, two matches after the horrible incident that happened with Dale Lewis. I was partners with Dale Lewis, uh, Nelson Royal, and Les Thatcher. And this is from the following week after this happens where they where he hurts the spectator and uh and during the match uh, while standing on the apron by my partner dale lewis is in the ring i watched the ambulance crew take the take the bloody and still dazed participant from the thousand dollar challenge match out of the building while i'm standing on the apron of the ring and i'm involved in the tag match with nelson royal and les thatcher uh, the week after this, this all went down, uh, the ambulance red lights were still flashing outside through the windows of the building. You could just see the red lights flashing through the crowd. All of that was really having an effect on me because of, 
you know, I'm getting all these horrible thoughts during this about, uh, you know, while I stood on the apron of the ring about the many terrible possible repercussions from this night, you know, the crazy things like lawsuits and bankruptcy were flashing through my mind, along with the closing of my brand new wrestling company. So I'm not sure what happened to me, but the next thing I knew, you know, uh, I left the ring and, and I'm walking back to the dressing room and, uh, and I hear the bell ring as Les Thatcher and Nelson Royal just beat my partner, Dale Lewis. So it was one of the worst nights I can remember in wrestling. And I was now in the, dre- in the dressing room with Danny Hodge. And this, you know, he had caused all the problems of that night. I can't, I, I can't see it any other way than that because, uh, you know, I obviously witnessed it. Uh, most everyone else on the card was gone. And I sat down with Danny by myself to discuss what was next for he and I. For both of us, uh, uh, obviously he was sorry for losing his temper and he'd had time to settle down. Uh, and then, uh, we start, uh, going down to the ring, uh, during Dale's challenge match. Uh, you know, he lost his temper and he lost the control and he, he, he did something horrible and he regretted it. And I, I, I firmly believe that he was being honest about it. And, uh, and you know, uh, and Lord knows he, he was not nearly as sorry as I was about it, but, uh, but still, it bothered him. So Dale came into the dressing room after this tag match in which I'd left him in the ring, not too happy with my leaving him alone to face the two Tennessee tag champions, but quickly left Danny and I because I'm sure he wanted no part of the conversation that we were having. I'm sure he picked up that we're talking about what happened that caused all this. So so, so bear in mind, I'm only 27 years old. I'm sitting face to face with one of the most feared athletes in the world, and neither of us are happy about what had happened earlier in the evening. Danny kept insisting that that the mark was not hurt that bad, but I kept reminding him that the mark would not have been hurt at all if not for him. Uh, ultimately, he couldn't argue with my point, as a matter of fact, that he was responsible and it was very nice to finally say, well... Uh, what are we going to do with me? You know, it comes down to the bottom line here and it, us arguing back and forth about whose fault it was. You know, he just cuts right to the chase. You know, he'd been around a while and, you know, what, what what's going to happen to me? So in the process of getting my first real, I'm right in the middle of getting my first bad experience with being the owner of a wrestling company. I like Danny Hodge. And as almost every other wrestler on earth did, Danny had a tremendous personality. Everybody liked him. And this was something that very few owners, maybe none, had ever had to deal with. My first thought at this moment was how much I hated to own Southeastern Wrestling. It's <laughs> like, geez, man, this is becoming tough. You know, it was a dark day for me. In the, and, and I felt like it was the dark day for the future of my company. So after a long pause, Danny and I are sitting there and he asked me, what do you want? What are you going to do with me? And I had my head down thinking, and, uh, you know, I'd kind of made up my mind what I wanted to do, but, um, I finally looked up at Danny and I said, you know, I've got to give you a notice. And under the circumstances, uh, I'll, I'll only use you for one more week. You know, I felt like, you know, not just giving him a notice was enough. Uh, you know, I, I, I it needed to be a little tough punishment kind of that went along with it. And, uh, and I said, and I would like for you to put Jimmy Golden over in a loser leave town match next week, which will be your last night here on next Friday. And I kind of braced myself for the reply, you know, this could have changed everything between me and Danny, you know, uh, depending on what he thinks about that. So, but he's always the gentleman. Danny's really, really a fine guy. And he, he puts his head down as I had, and he's thinking about his answer. And uh, when he looked up, uh, as best I can remember, he said, I don't blame you. You know, I made a big mistake tonight, and it's likely to hurt you much more than it's going to hurt me. And I'll do the job for Golden if you'll make me one promise to give forgive me and use me again in the future. Uh, then he Went on, you know, in fact, I'll do a job on TV for you tomorrow to prove how bad I feel about what happened. And uh, obviously I said, thank you. I didn't in, I didn't expect that to happen. But, you know, he, he felt really bad about what he had caused. And he, you know, he he was dealing with it in his own mind, I'm sure. And he kind of just said, yes, I'll do whatever you want. In fact, I'll throw in a job for you on TV. So, uh, 
You know, I felt like, uh, you know, I, I felt that maybe I'd handle that pretty well. So now I had to deal with Dale Lewis, you know. So I explained what happened when I left the ring minutes earlier. And uh, I had to tell him, you know, Dale, you know, how watching those guys take that mark out was almost too much for me. And watching the ambulance and the lights flashing in the building. And I told him about the horrible thoughts that were running through my head at that time. And uh, Dale's such a, he's a great guy. I mean, very low key. The hard to upset, the level headed, you know, and in my opinion, he had no fault in what happened. Uh, anyone being threatened by somebody like Danny Hodge would have done the same thing he did. I told him that and uh, he apologized profusely for what happened. And, uh, and I told him I was sorry to have left him in the ring alone. But it would probably lead to him being a bigger baby face and being a baby face, obviously, now. And uh, that would work perfectly for a single match with him and me. Uh, we could make it a title match and a challenge match with the winner getting both the belt and $1,000 and from the losing opponent. So uh, what had happened in tag match actually did turn him baby face and was a perfect reason for us to come back against each other. I thought we would draw a full house the next Friday night. And we did. The only problem that we were both worried about was what the future held concerning the guy who was stretchered out that night, the the guy that that uh, went to the hospital. And we were both kind of hung on that. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but uh, I was as concerned about it as he was. So the following day on TV was a great show. All the boys were in a good mood, including Danny and Dale. Uh, everyone was ready to take care of the most important vehicle for promoting the next Friday night car to Chihuahua Park, and that's definitely our television program. So I'd worked on this show for hours after coming home from the matches the night before. It helped me focus on something other than the disastrous $1,000 challenge match in which the guy had been taken out on a stretcher. The events of that night dictated the direction we needed to go the next day, in my mind. The disastrous $1,000 challenge match had led to Danny's upcoming last Friday appearance, and it was going to also be Dutch Mantell's and John Foley's last TV and an appearance on the following Friday night. So I was going to lose three talented stars for my Knoxville cards in the very next week because of what's gone down. Hey, Ron, if I could uh, stop you real quick and ask you a couple of questions. One, you said that when you and Danny were having that conversation in the locker room, you had already made up your mind. When did you make up your mind? When did you know you had to give him notice for doing that? Well, I think, actually, I kind of made up my mind when he just insisted and when he went down there hot-headed and, he, and the way he screamed so loud that the whole crowd could hear what he was saying. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it really bothered me. And, uh, and I, I couldn't help but give him a notice, to be honest with you. I mean, how do you not, during a deal like that, and uh, he realized you know, he tried to say, well, he wasn't hurt that bad, but he really realized that, well, you know, he wouldn't have been hurt at all if I just stood up there by you, Ron, and left it, left things alone. And so I think he kind of expected it. And, and that was kind of my feelings when I saw him demanding to poor Dale, who's standing there white. <laughs> like a ghost because Danny Hodge is saying, if you don't stomp that guy in the face, I'm coming in there to get you. And, uh, you know, when you can hear that, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. So I, I think he just really pushed it too far. And I felt like uh, that's what had to happen. He had to get a notice for sure. Well, when it comes to that second part that you just mentioned there, cause you brought this up before too, you said how no one would have the guts to say no to Danny Hodge, or you didn't say it that way, but how Dale Lewis was fearful of saying no to Danny Hodge. But here you have Dale Lewis, who has his own collegiate wrestling background and amateur wrestling background. He's in these challenge matches for a reason, and that is that you feel confident he can handle himself against whatever is going to come out of that crowd. Is it crazy to think that he could have possibly held his own at this point in time versus Danny Hodge, or was it no question? Danny would go in there, and despite all the background that Dale Lewis has, Danny would have just eaten him right up. I think it's the latter of that. I believe it's Danny would have eaten him up. Uh, Danny, Danny was a different animal than Dale. Uh, their psychology, uh, the, the way they handled themselves in and out of the ring was different. Uh, 
uh, Dale was so, like I said, laid back and low keyed and, you know, never got excited. Uh, never. Danny had a, had that drive in him. Uh, and there's one other thing that Danny had that Dale didn't have and that Danny could box. And, uh, you know, the, and, you know, when you've got a guy that's a tremendous wrestling shooter like uh, Hodge was, and then he has the ability, if he gets really in trouble and it needs to happen, he has the ability to take you out with a damn punch. Uh, that's, that's, that you have to consider that. When you're dealing with Danny Hodge, you're not just wrestling a wrestling shooter, you're wrestling a wrestling and boxing shooter. And you, you better be careful <laughs> because you're you're likely to get hurt. If Danny had come along 20 or so years later, do you think he would have been someone that would have gone into something like the UFC? And how do you think he would have done in mixed martial arts? Wow. I mean, that's a great that's a great point right there. I think he would have been King Damn Kong. I think Danny <laughs> Hodge would have been unbelievable in UFC. I mean, you know, he... He had he had that tendon strength in those hands, and he got his hands on guys. He would have just took them down. He would have rode the hell out of them. And at some point, I don't doubt that he would have laid them out with the punch. You know, uh, God, competing with a guy like that in an USC UFC event would he would be a terror. You know, I, I would be a scared to death of him if I were if I were in that sport and I, they had him across the ring from me in the octagon or whatever they call it, uh, you know. But, wow, he would be a monster in that. So let's get back to the TV show, Ron, because you said that you kept yourself distracted after the disturbing events the previous night by working on the TV. What did you work on? What was going on on TV? Well... Yeah, and I had a loaded TV. Wow, a tremendous program. Uh, you know, I'd recorded the Hodge and Golden match from the night before, uh, and I'd recorded the last match, thank goodness, with Dale Lewis and I against Thatcher and Royal, in which I just walk out and leave him basically. Uh, and I also, for the first time, recorded an interview with Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto, who had been pretty regular there. Uh, about their tag match for the next Friday night. And I'm going to put them against Mantell and Foley, who are leaving anyway. So I utilized by doing that, cutting that recording at the matches on Friday night, and those guys not being available on Saturday, Jarrett and, and Yamamoto. Uh, I, I was using the same technique that Jarrett was using me every Monday night <laughs> in Memphis and doing these huge crowds. And I wasn't ever working his televisions. I would just shoot these interviews after the match, and they'd run that on the following Saturday. And I said, well, heck, I'm going to do it over here. I want to record you, Jerry, and, uh, and Tojo. I'd like for you all to do an interview for me, facing Mantell and Foley next to Friday night. So that came in great, uh, and I'm going to start doing more of it. Once I, once I see this go down, I, I realize that, man, they, they, I need to make more more out of this. So I spent much of the remainder of Friday night and early Saturday morning putting together the great TV. And uh, here's how it went down. I opened the show with Jimmy. Jimmy Golden at the desk, watching himself and describing his luck. Uh, I talked to Jimmy. Jimmy and I talked before he goes out there. And I said, Jimmy, humble, 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 man. You don't want to be cocky. You're a baby face. You're a good looking kid. You want to be humble. So Jimmy goes out there and watches himself beat Danny Hodge twice in, in 12 seconds with the same hold. And he's very, very uh, to the point when it comes to describing his luck and what a thrill it was to beat a guy like that twice with the same hold. Uh, so at the end of his interview, in his, his interviews based on the match. So he's watching this match, but it's very short, you know, but, uh, Hodge comes out. Hodge comes right out as the dead and there Jimmy's still at the desk. So he comes out of the dressing room and he angrily confronts Jimmy at the desk, telling him, Yeah, you're just a young punk, and that was lucky and it never happened again. And uh so the card for the next Friday night had just been shown because we had first interview that we showed the card and then we had an interview segment. So we had shown the we had shown the card. The interview had been shown of that Danny is wrestling against uh, uh, Jimmy, okay? Uh, and it, retained, it just said they're in a return match. 
So Hodge goes out and he challenged Jimmy not only to a match live on TV that day. He says, I want to straighten this out right here today live. And then I want to add a stipulation to next Friday's night's match with you, kid. Uh, And he asked Golden to accept the loser leaves town match. The whoever gets beat Friday night is gone. So Jimmy, you know, obviously he accepts both the live match on TV that day and he accepts the loser leave town stipulation for the Friday, following Friday night. Uh, the crowd popped, especially because of the loser leave town. Uh, and both the Golden and Hodge quickly dressed and they're going to come back and wrestle on the show against each other in the third match of that program. So, and remember the night before uh, Chill Howie with uh, both falls ended with a, the O'Connor row. Yeah. Uh, so when they started that TV match, uh, this now we're going to jump ahead to the beginning of the third match, and there comes Jimmy now is dressed to wrestle. Hodge is dressed to wrestle. They've challenged the Hodges challenged him to wrestle him right here on t- TV live, and uh, so they go to the middle of the ring just like they did on the taped program, and Hodge they shake hands. And then when the bell rings, Jimmy's turned his back and Hodge tries to roll him up again. You know, I mean, he wants to beat him. I think he just wanted to beat him with the move he got beat with twice. And, uh, but, uh, Jimmy's, Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy kicks out on the count of two. He's got him rolled. He makes the roll up, but, uh, Jimmy kicks out of it. And, uh, and then, uh, Hodge comes charging him and Jimmy kicks him in the stomach and grabs him when he's bent over. Uh, and then gives him a real quick snap suplex. And uh, then he went straight to the top rope on the far side of the ring from Hodge. And when Danny slowly got to his feet and turned around, Golden hit him with a tremendous drop kick off the top rope from all the way across the ring and pinned him for a three count. <laughs> so he beat him again, basically, in, in 15 seconds this time or 20 seconds or something. You know, I mean, it's crazy. that you know? So... The TV audience went nuts, um, and they mobbed Jimmy on the way out of the ring, and Hodge went crazier than any of them. I mean, he charged the desk, and he he made a fantastic interview then about never in his life losing three times in a row to anyone. And he guaranteed a win over Jimmy Golden the next Friday night, and he added that Golden had been there less than six weeks, and that young punk might as well start packing his bags today because his Knoxville career is over next Friday night. Uh, Heck of an interview. Uh, Program's off to a great start. How was Jimmy getting over with the fans already at this point, and were you happy with the way he was getting over? He was getting over fabulously, man. I mean, and he had guys were, he was working with great talent and that's what's getting him over. And this little thing that's happening here between him and Hodge is really getting him over because Hodge is a tremendous, legitimate, fabulous athlete. And everybody recognizes him as one of the best wrestlers in the world. So Jimmy's off and running, man, as far as getting over in the territory. And I can see that he's going to take his places. Uh, so the first live TV match uh, took advantage of Mantell's and Foley's last television match. They were on TV. They're leaving the next Friday night. And, uh, and Thatcher and Royal beat them right there in the middle on TV. And then Thatcher and Royal go to the desk immediately following that great win over two two of the better the best heel team I had there for months, uh, and they start talking about defending the Tennessee tag titles, which they're the champions the next week against a very respected uh, new tag team combination coming to Knoxville uh, for me the first time Jack and Jim Dalton, a uh, great tag combination and. Uh, that's another going to be another great match that following Friday night. Uh, hey, can second, I ask you the Daltons that you're using? That's not what Don Fargo is the fake Dalton, is it, or is it the actual? Because there there were two brothers that were Daltons, correct? Yes, yes. Now, these are the two boys. These are the two brothers. This wasn't Fargo. Okay, because a lot of people are going to be wondering, and they hear that name, they're going to go, "Oh, I think Jack Dalton was Don Fargo." But you're saying in this situation, it wasn't. Yes. Uh, this these the two brothers were basically working together then as a team and uh and i didn't see, i didn't seen them very much uh but uh gosh i i know fargo and uh fargo wasn't he wasn't uh, there uh jim dalton uh, been around a long time i know jim dalton very well 
Uh, and Jack, his brother, was the first time I believe I ever saw him was in that tag match. So the second live match is with Rocky Smith. Uh, now, he's the club-footed Inferno, and Rocky and I had been talking, and I said, Rocky, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, got, I'm, I'm losing heels here. I'm going to have three people out next Friday that's going to leave the crew, and uh, I, need, I need to use you in a better way. I want you to go back to being an Inferno. Get the loaded boot on. And uh, so... We then ran a pre-recorded interview with Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto talking about also meeting Mantell and Foley. We ran that right after that second live match. And then the third match, obviously, I uh, just described was between Golden and Hodge. we got a pretty darn good program going here. Everybody's all tied in to what's happening on the next Friday night. And uh, last segment on that TV show is Dale Lewis watching a large part, which the match wasn't that long. We might just about did the entire match and showed it all on TV with me leaving him, leaving the ring on him. And uh, it showed me leaving alone and causing him to lose his first match ever in Knoxville against Thatcher and Royal. And that was, a, he really, I hadn't really thought about it, but Dale had never lost in Knoxville. So he lost his first match uh, against two guys, basically. And uh, so, and then he called me a coward on, on the interview and he promised the fans that he was not, he was not going to leave the ring the next Friday without my prize possession. That was the Southern heavyweight title. And that uh, he felt so confident he would make a thousand dollar challenge match for me if I'd be willing to do the same thing for him. So in essence, the winner of that match the following Friday night is going to be the Southern heavyweight champion, and he's going to be $1,000 richer from the guy who beat him. So fans accepted him immediately as a babyface because he's working against me. I mean, I got some pretty decent heat at this point, and uh, they were just happy to see that I'm going to have to wrestle a big, tough dude. Uh, so they were into it. Uh, so I made the last interview on the show, and uh, kind of set the stage for another sellout the uh, following Friday. A couple quick questions, Ron. You mentioned before how you realized you were going to be short. Your crew was going to be short. You were losing three heels. At any point between the previous night and the next day on TV, had you even given thought to reconsidering Danny Hodge leaving? You know, I, that's a big decision. You got a talent like Danny Hodge, and I don't care what he did wrong. It's pretty hard to give a guy like that a notice. But, gosh, in this case, he, what he did wrong was really horribly wrong. And, uh, I, you know, I hated to see him go. I mean, gosh, I, I didn't have a big, great crew at this point. I'm just six months in as an owner of a company, and I'm trying to piece together a decent crew. Uh, in 77 and 78 and 79, I'm going to have fabulous crews in Knoxville and it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't hurt me bad, but yeah, that's a pretty big blow when you lose Mantel Foley and Danny Hodge all in the same night. And they're not going to be back for a long darn time. That's, that's, that's the whole deal. And yeah, it, I just felt like, uh, that I had to, I just had to do it. And then when it comes to Dale, you mentioned that you didn't really blame him as much for the incident with the fan because of the pressure Danny was putting on him from ringside and the threat to come in there and kick his butt. But Dale doesn't last too much longer. I hate to play spoiler here, but Dale doesn't last too much longer in Southeastern. Is that a result of it was you finished him up because of this incident? Was there anything else that led into that? What leads to Dale Lewis not lasting much longer? Well, what really happens to Dale is he gets scared. Um, and we, this is within a couple of weeks of this time frame, we're going to sit down and Dale's going to say, Ron, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid, you know, we had a, we had a, a, a document sign that attorney drew up that if you got hurt, uh, you weren't, you were responsible uh, for your injuries yourself. But, you know, turns out that's just a piece of paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dan, they, they felt real uncomfortable with the fact that this guy's going to come after me, Ron, he's going to, he's going to come and sue me. And, uh, you know, and, and I felt, you know, there's a good chance that that happened. And, uh, it was back in a time frame when not everybody sued like they do nowadays, 
but there were lawsuits. And I thought the guy, you know, once I found out that the document that was written for me by an attorney is really not not going to to, to, to protect me nor nor Dale. Uh, and when Dale, Dale brought this point up to me, you know, Ron, I, I, I'm afraid he's going to come after me and he's going to, uh, I, I said, you know, I said, Dale, you need to go. You know, uh, I felt bad for Dale because it really wasn't his fault. And, uh, you know, I would have kept him a lot longer, obviously. But, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, I should be, it's my business. I'm the guy that owns it. And if somebody's going to have a problem about what goes on, it probably ought to be me rather than one of the boys. So it sounds like coming out of this TV, all things considered, even though a lot of the booking was done on the fly since the previous night, you are pretty well situated and pretty well set up for the next show, which I believe would have been Friday, April 4th, 1975 in Knoxville. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. Great television here. Uh we are. We're in good position for the next Friday night. You've got Dale Lewis, who is a strong heel. It's been turned baby face. He's wrestling the top heel in the territory. Uh, you've got the tag team championship with the new guys out there wrestling with the tag champions. You've got uh, Mantell and Foley uh, basically uh, going to end up their, their, their run in Southeastern. Uh, it's a uh, We've got a good card, man, and uh, and maybe the most important person in charge of uh, running the show, you know, everything's perfect for this Friday the 4th, except for maybe the most important person in charge of running this television program, and that's my old buddy, my renegade commentator, Big Jim Hess. <laughs> uh, I mean, it didn't take long for that to become obvious uh, on this Saturday uh, prior to the April 4th card. When uh, Big Jim doesn't show up until right before, probably uh, 10 minutes before the show's actually going to go on the air. Uh, that, I just, uh, you know, there's no 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 excuse for that. Uh, so when he arrives late, and I handed him the format for the show, it, we, we don't have but a second or two to even talk about what's on the format. And he barely looks at the format, and he just took it and tossed it on his desk. And then he turns and asks me, why are there two recorded matches from the night before on this TV? And uh, I didn't even bother to answer him because I felt like if he was so stupid as not to be able to see the benefit of having those live recorded matches on television, then uh, why waste my time trying to explain it to him? I mean, you know, uh, those that's what really makes things happen and haven't been in Florida for a lot of years and watching their television, they built the everything off those live matches. They would run those suckers. There'd be two, sometimes three in every show. And it also helps you with those live matches because you've got a much bigger crowd. You've got maybe a hundred people in your studio, but you've got three, 4,000 in your arena. And gosh, the difference is really amazing. So he just, you know, it, it was just another way of him him trying to to get to me. Uh, and then he, he, after he threw it on there, he th throws it on the desk. Uh, uh, <clears throat> then, and I, I don't even bother really to answer his question. Uh, uh, then he comes up with <laughs> with another thing, another question that just really, man, uh, this really throws me. He goes, uh. Then he goes, uh, I, he asked me why Ron Wright was not on the TV. And uh, and he knew Ron Wright had gotten hurt during our Texas death match on the second Coliseum show. And he'd not worked since that Coliseum show. Uh, in fact, Ron Wright was going to miss four straight weeks because of the injury he had. And it would not wrestle again until the third Coliseum show on Sunday, April 27th. That's four shows after after he got hurt. So during the program, Big Jim did just about everything imaginable to ruin a great show. And uh, I left the TV station more aware than ever that something had to be done about this guy. Uh, this The big problem was the fact that he worked full time for this station and to try to remove him as a commentator could possibly cost me the show itself. A lot of negative things were happening at the same time, from the $1,000 challenge debacle the week before uh, to fixing my TV problem. 
I was the Southeastern wrestling owner in trouble at that point. I, I, I won the match with Dale Lewis and uh, obviously kept my belt. And I, and I got a thousand bucks from him. Uh, should have, you know, but that obviously the, there was no money changed hands. Uh, and I, and I think he had another stipulation that he put on there that he had to be beat in 10 minutes. If I couldn't beat him in 10 minutes, even if I won after 10 minutes, I wouldn't get his thousand dollars and I beat him in eight minutes. So uh, Jimmy Golden beat Danny Hodge, and Hodge disappeared from Knoxville for quite a while. That was a uh, loser leaves town match. That's a loser leaves town match. And so Danny Hodge is gone, and he's not going to come back to, to Knoxville for quite a while. Uh, Thatcher and Royal retained their Tennessee tag titles against Jack and Jim Dalton. Tojo Yamamoto and Jerry Jarrett uh, beat, obviously, Dutch Mantel and John Foley. Uh, Foley never wrestled in Knoxville again. And uh, it'd be years before Dutch would return to Knoxville for Southeastern. Uh, the Inferno, Rocky Smith with his mask on, beat DeVoy Brunson in the other match. Uh, so uh, another big crowd. Uh, we kind of got things going pretty good, man. Uh, it doesn't make any difference now whether we're in the small building or the Coliseum. We're starting to get some headway. Uh, so the next week card, let's just jump ahead to the next week's card on uh, April 11th. Friday, April 11th, uh, and that's a very special card for me because I get to work with one of the all-time greats, a former NWA world champion and a personal friend of mine from New Zealand, Pat O'Connor. Uh, Pat was born in Ratihi, New Zealand on August 22nd, 1924. Just happens to be the same year my grandfather, Roy Welch, began his wrestling career. Uh, O'Connor won the New Zealand Heavyweight Amateur Championship in 1948, the year I was born, and kept it until he turned pro in 1950. He held the NWA Heavyweight title from 1959 through 1961. Uh, he died August 16, 1990, and was inducted into no less than five major Hall of Fames. Uh, if you're not familiar with Pat O'Connor, uh, you can see a photo of him that I have on my Tennessee Stud, tnstud.com website. Uh, for each one of these episodes, the photo for number 97, that is this episode, it happens to be Pat O'Connor O'Connor rolling of all people, giant Baba in Japan. Uh, and he, I mean, he is sit down on Baba. You can tell Baba is not going to kick out of this O'Connor row. Uh, so, you know, fans like look at that, uh, you know, welcome to go to the website. You can find it there. And it's also on the gallery, the same photo on the gallery. Hey, Ron, Pat O'Connor was considered one of the best in-ring workers of his generation. Obviously he became NWA world heavyweight champion. But by the time you had started wrestling, it was a few years later. When did you actually first meet Pat O'Connor? I met Pat in 1973 when I started making those trips to St. Louis. When I was in Florida and uh, and and Muchnick called and said, would you like to work in St. Louis? I assumed he meant one time. I was thrilled with it. Yes, sir, I definitely would. And then I end up there almost for two years. Um, so, and Pat happens to be the booker there in 1973 and 74. And uh, he worked, and I worked almost every show in St. Louis for two years. Uh, and Pat loved my style of work. Uh, in fact, he often, I heard him tell guys uh, that I was the, I was a big man that could move and do anything in the ring that a smaller man could do. I think he loved the fact that I never, I, I never backed off from from trying anything anybody else could do. Uh, he he also loved my high leap frogs. He uh, every match he said, "Ron, you got to do the leap frog, two leap frogs." You know, uh, he liked my drop kicks and he liked my flying head scissors. So you know, I had moves that he liked, and uh, he quickly found out uh, being a booker that I was pretty decent with finishes, uh, which I had been learning from Eddie Graham in Florida. And and because he was the booker in St. Louis, he eventually had me figuring finishes for almost every match on every card. It started out with, Ron, why don't you figure your own finish tonight? Next week, it's, Ron, how about doing your match and, and that match? And the next week, it's this match and that match and your match. And uh, eventually, within four or five weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring finishes for all of Pat's cards. Uh, and, and he's loving it. Uh, and so is Sam. 
And I, I'm sure he's not going to Sam and saying, Ron Fuller's doing my finishes. <laughs> but I think Sam started seeing something different in the finishes. And, uh, you know, I, and uh, Pat told me, honestly, he said, Ron, you know, even Sam thinks your finishes are good. I don't think he knew they were my finishes. I doubt it. Uh, I think probably Pat told him they were his finishes. You know, uh, Eddie was such a fabulous finish guy. And it was just, it was really, really. And, you know, he... Once I got the finishing figures for every match, for every card, uh, he used to tell me, he go, you know, Ron, he goes, I'm, I owe you a big favor for, for what you do here for me every every other Friday night. Because he only ran St. Louis every other Friday night. And uh, he promised, he said, if, I, if you ever owned your own territory, kid, he goes, I'd come and put you over, man. So... I never thought that happened back in 1973, and I'm sure he didn't either. He probably wouldn't have said it. He, you know, he said it because he thought, well, this kid will never have a territory. But obviously, in October of 74, I own my own territory. So he's one of the first calls I made, and I said, Pat, you remember all those finishes that I did for you? And yeah, yeah. And he said, I heard you. I heard you. You, you own your own territory. And I said, yeah, I want you, man. So uh, uh, he's going he's gonna to come, uh, come right along and take care of what he said he would do. You said Pat really liked the way you worked as a big man. Makes me wonder, during your career, did any promoter or booker before you purchased Southeastern ever not like it? That you didn't work as a typical big man, that you worked almost like a junior heavyweight who just happened to be seven feet tall? I think everybody liked it because it was different. I mean, very few guys at my height uh, wrestled like a small guy. And, and my dad kind of told me when I first started training, that he saw that I was pretty, pretty coordinated and, and I was a pretty decent shooter too. And so he told me, he said, you know, you should never limit yourself as to what you can do because you think you're big and tall. And uh, that kind of stuck with me. And when I trained, I always wanted to be able to do whatever anybody else could do in the ring. And I, I think uh, anybody that used a guy that had a big guy that could really wrestle and could really move and, and work with anybody, I think that's one of the keys. You have an ability when you can wrestle some and you can make all the moves and you can do all the things. Uh, you have a you have that built-in ability to have great matches every night and uh, and that's that's how you keep territory. That's how you keep getting back to St. Louis, I guess, in a way. Uh, Pat liked it, and Pat was uh, right there in the ear of Mutchnik, and he's saying, I like this kid. Let's bring him back. Let's bring him back. Let's make a star out of it. And they end up doing that. Pat's in the ear of Mutchnik. Pat is Mr. St. Louis, and obviously you mentioned last time on the show, you and Sam were in communication at this period of time. Yeah, yeah. We're good friends. Good friends. Uh, uh, and uh, lots of times when I went to St. Louis to work, I would uh, catch a cab and go down to the office. And uh, I really enjoyed sitting when talking to Sam. And, you know, I, I did that the very first time I was ever booked there. And I spent five hours in that wrestling office. I'd never seen anything like it. The walls were like a museum. It was just unbelievable. And, uh, and, and I always had a great rapport with Sam Muchnick. Uh, really, really like Sam. Uh, he's a pretty easy guy to get along with. Uh, but, and gosh, man, had such respect in the National Wrestling Alliance. Uh, he'd, he'd been around a long time. And you said last time on the show that he had not only booked you for future events in St. Louis, way into the future, but also he had given you a date much sooner than you anticipated with Jack Briscoe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he really took care of me. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I now got a date for the third Coliseum show. Exactly on the, what you're talking about. On Sunday, April 27th, I got Jack Briscoe. He settled. He's set to defend his NWA world title. And I needed a real good person, a way to, to choose an opponent for him on that date. And uh, what better way? I started thinking about it. I, yeah, I didn't give... Pat O'Connor, a date that I wanted him on until I looked at this card. When I got that Jack Briscoe date, I said, gosh, this is perfect. I need to bring in Pat O'Connor, a former world champion, uh, and wrestle him myself. And the winner of that match gets Jack Briscoe two weeks later. A perfect little setup right there. And uh, 
So that's what I did. I, I booked, and thank goodness, Pat was able and available. So uh, so I brought him in, and uh, I wrestled him. I'm the Southern Heavyweight Champion. He is one of the best former NWA champions of all time. And uh, and the winner gets the Briscoe shot. Uh, Pat O'Connor was a smooth and fast wrestler in the ring. Wow. I, people need to. He is just fabulous. And there are still films of him there are still matches out there uh he just was so smooth in the ring and uh and fast i mean like lightning uh and uh you know it, it, for fans that's never seen him you know I, I i think you need to go to youtube uh you know uh and i highly recommend all fans to check out some of his work uh, and experience the moves of one of the best that ever put on a pair of tights uh he invented the o'connor row that's named after him. And, uh, and that was such a, a huge part of the recent stuff going on between Jimmy Golden and Danny Hodge it was all based around uh, his hold, the O'Connor roll. And two weeks later, after this goes down, uh, I'm wrestling the guy that invented that. Uh, so let's go ahead, Brian, and just reveal the entire Knoxville card for April 11th, the entire event. Uh, the main event, obviously, is the former NWA and AWA world champion, Pat O'Connor versus me. Uh, and, and, Pat and Pat O'Connor is managed by Ron Wright on this night, which yes. obviously helps get him over to those fans who may Absol not have seen him so much. Absolutely. Ron Wright being in his corner makes it all work. It's just beautiful. I mean, and Wright is coming back. Uh, in two more weeks, he's he's going to be healthy enough to be back in the ring. But throwing him in there as Pat O'Connor's manager, wow. I mean, it gives me something to bitch about on TV. Wait a minute here. Like the former NWA world champion needs help. He's got Ron Wright, and you know what he's likely to do. So, you know, uh, it worked out to be a great thing. Uh, and obviously the winner of that match is going to face Jack Briscoe in less than Less than three weeks on Sunday, April 12th, 27th in the Coliseum. Uh, the semi-main event for Friday, April 11th, was for the tag, Tennessee Tag Championship. Les Thatcher and Nelson Royal facing another new team. Second week in a row. And this team is going to get it done. Uh, Ron and Don Bass, managed by Sam Bass. Uh, Jimmy Golden, the rising star, man, uh, at this point, is facing a guy named Jim White. There's a ladies' midget match featuring Diamond Lil and Darling Dagmar. Uh, Dale Lewis faces Tony Peters. And another new team, the Infernos, are going to wrestle Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto. This is one of the first shows at Knoxville's Chilhowee Park that's going to have six matches on it. And I'm able to book more matches now per card because my attendance is climbing. And... Uh, and even in Chihuahua Park, the attendance is climbing. So I'm edging up with the number of matches that fans are getting, and uh, and I'm trying to just keep improving that talent. Ron, you talked earlier how you built up the previous card on TV. How did you build up the show on the 11th on your television show? Well, that, that actual TV show was on April 5th, and it featured the two new tag team uh, that's replacing Mantel and Foley, Ron and Don Bass. They're, they're going to be managed by Sam Bass. Uh, they're right there on TV that day. So they've just wrestled. They're going to be wrestling the next Friday night. They get a real strong win on TV. And then you've got the Infernos wrestling on that same TV. Now there's two of them, Rocky Smith. And the second one is Billy Spears. Uh, and they make a great impression on the fans. Uh, and then I had Pat. O'Connor sent me a film of his NWA title match with Buddy Rogers from Chicago with more than 38,000 fans in Comiskey Park. Uh, and I watched that match and commentated over the parts of the match that I wanted to show. And I did my best to keep Jim, big Jim Hess from ruining the action with his comments. Uh, uh, you know, everything he says is wrong. It's so bad that I think he's doing it on purpose constantly, but, uh, so, and he, Pat also sent an interview in to me about that upcoming match with me on Friday night in Chihuahua Park. And it was great because he focused on the fact that he was in the twilight of his career and he would, he had very few chances left to earn an NWA title shot. 
uh, I thought I loved that interview because it's uh, it it made sense and then you know he he's starting to look a little bit old at this point, but he's still fabulous in the ring. Uh, so that that was a fabulous interview and uh, and he puts me over in his interview. He says how much he respects me as an up and coming star. I think he used those kind of words. And then after the interview, <laughs> there's the perfect example. After the interview. What comes out of Big Jim's mouth, he says, uh, he, he says, you know, that, that guy, Ron O'Connor, he, he looks awfully old to still be in the ring. Oh, my God. Oh, I just, and I'm like, oh, my, I just want to, I want to slap him, you know, but <laughs> I, I know I can't, I can't, you know, but uh, so it was totally uncalled for comment. And uh, I couldn't help but reply after he said it. And I think I said something like, uh, you know, that old guy you just called him is going to be here next week live on TV. And I hope that you, Big Jim, are going to be stupid enough to call Pat O'Connor <laughs> that to his face. Because, I said, he might kick your big ass right here on TV. <laughs> well, they blipped the ass part of it, you know, but the fans heard it in the studio and the fans popped. They <laughs> They got a big thrill out of me saying that Pat O'Connor might just whip your big ass, you know, right here. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's just like a, he's just like going, going way, way over where he should be. Uh, well, like I said, they bleeped out the ass part, but the studio laughed at him. And, oh, boy, Big Jim didn't like it. He got really red in the face. He couldn't say anything. He knew he was best not to open his mouth. He'd already made his, made an ass of himself, literally. So uh, I did my best job as uh, the rest of that show to keep Big Jim down as much as I could and uh, give him as little to say as possible. So each Saturday now was becoming more difficult for me to deal with my renegade commentator. Uh, but nonetheless... This is another excellent TV, and we followed it six days later on Friday, April 11th, with another full house at Chill Alley Park. Uh, I had a wonderful match with uh, with my man. Uh, wonderful, wonderful match. Hey, Ron, real quick, why don't we go over the results to that show? Uh, you have the New Infernos defeating Jerry Jarrett and Tojo Yamamoto, mm -hmm. Professor Dale Lewis defeating Tony Peters, Diamond Lil beating Darling Dagmar in the ladies' midget match. Jimmy Golden defeating Jim White, who obviously had a history in Knoxville. Ron and Don Bass, managed by Sam Bass, took the Tennessee Tag Championship from Les Thatcher and Nelson Royal. So a title change there. Title change. And then yeah. in the main event, the Tennessee stud Ron Fuller defeating Pat O'Connor in the main event, winning the opportunity to face Jack Briscoe for the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship in three weeks at the next show that you're running at the Knoxville Coliseum. Right. right. Great card. Great night. Full house. Uh, fans really loving every bit of it. Super matches thrown in there. I mean, uh, Ron Don Bass, fabulous team, uh, working with uh, – with you know, with uh, Nelson Royal and Thatcher, got got to have a great match, a really really great card. Uh, but I'd like to close out our our episode today with uh, something that's happening during this time frame that's really going to affect my entire future as a wrestler and more so as an owner of Southeastern Wrestling. Uh, we've been talking about Big Jim Hess and the television station that I'm currently on when I bought Knoxville. And I've been struggling with this renegade commentator and a television station that has limited range that would never be able to support my chances to own a territory, to have a territory. I would just be a one town operation, basically. Now, I'm already on Network's television station in Johnson City, Tennessee, with a good range that's north of Knoxville, but it still doesn't cover enough cities to create a territory. So, I'm feeling really threatened at this point with my television situation. My relationship with Big Jim is just not good, and he could be undermining my position with the current television station's ownership because he's a valuable employee to them. So I got a, I got a real dilemma here. If I terminate him, they may terminate me and my company, Southeastern Wrestling, from their television station. 
And if I try to get another station to air my show and that fails, then I would probably definitely be out of my present station because my present station would find out that I made an attempt to move to another station. So chances of that happening are really pretty good because TV stations were extremely competitive and they kept their eyes and ears on what was happening locally among them. So I was in a rotten mess with my television situation. To have the future I had envisioned, I had to try to make a move that could be disastrous. And uh, so I did. I made a, I made a really big decision. I, I, I decided not just to, to not to can hit uh, Big Jim. I decided to leave that television station and start all over with my own people and uh and my thinking is less thatcher as my commentator and so on friday april 4th 1975 i show up at the door of the largest and strongest television station in knoxville channel 10 the cbs national network affiliate uh, i'm dressed in my best suit and i asked the receptionist if i could speak to someone in management about their potential interest in the quality wrestling program I was told to have a seat, and about 30 minutes later, I was escorted upstairs to the offices of the sales manager of WBIR in Knoxville. I got my first look at the man who was who is going to make me a success. I had no idea that that was about to happen, but uh, this guy and I are just going to have a fabulous relationship in the future there. And uh, he's going to really back my efforts to make Southeastern Wrestling one of the best small territories in the history of the sport. The guy's name was Lynn Lepper, and uh, he had, and we had about a 20-minute conversation talking about he wanted to know who I was and why I thought I could make wrestling one of the biggest and most successful programs ever on the air in Knoxville. Uh, I was up against some great odds because the current show was not that popular, and my show over there on the small station was not that popular, and the ratings weren't very good because I hadn't been there long enough. I hadn't had an opportunity, uh, and I'd probably increased those ratings by a little bit because uh, I'd brought better talent and because I had some Coliseum exposure, which I'd never had before. Uh, but none of that showed up yet in the two major rating books of those time, that time frame, which is Arbitron and Nielsen. Uh, I hadn't been there long enough to get a book that, that told me what type of audience I had. So in a bad position, uh, I'm talking to a sales manager and he's aware of the low ratings. And, uh, and he's aware of the type of wrestling program that was there before me. So I was about to get a real lesson in how television stations and networks operate, all of which are based upon these two rating companies that measure how much audience each show produces. Um, Mr. Lepper was very kind and extremely helpful by explaining the basics of it all to me. And finally, asked if he could arrange a meeting between me and the proper gentleman to discuss the subject with. Uh, he said, give him a few days, and he would call me to let me know if he could put a, be a meeting together to have me in to talk to everybody that would be necessary to get on the air with them. Uh, so basically, I'd open the door, but I had no idea how to sell myself or my business at this point. I'm young. I don't know what to do. Now, I think I'm going to get an appointment. I wanted to get started right away and start putting together a plan or presentation that could lead to my success, but decided to wait and hear the answer before beginning that big project. Uh, I felt good about Lynn Lepper, but I had no idea how many other exec executives there at that uh, channel and that station that was going to need that I was going to need to impress like I had felt like I had done with uh, Leper to get this monumental feat accomplished. And we are talking about a monumental feat to leave a small UHF station and go to the biggest one in the city and get them to accept your wrestling show at 27 years of age and not ever having seen big, huge numbers when it came to wrestling. So, uh, I'm, I, my work's cut out for me here and you know, when I am going to get an appointment. So at only 27, I'm about to count a totally different part of the business than what happens in the ring. This has got nothing to do with the finishes and with the boys and the talent. This is all totally different part of the business. And uh, I had no idea what I was about to learn. 
would not only set me on a path to success in building three other wrestling companies, but 14 years later, this presentation that I'm about to do when I get a date is going to produce my success in a totally different sport, hockey. Uh, I waited impatiently for the call, and, that, and it came one week later. Well, Ron, you're not the only one that's going to be waiting a week impatiently. I think the listeners of this show are as well to hear what happens next. But as we wrap things up, we want to remind you that you can become friends with the Tennessee Stud on Facebook, the page Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud. You can find the Tennessee Stud on Instagram and Twitter at Ron Fuller Welch. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com. And you can follow the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network on Twitter at Super Podcasts. Don't forget the latest Super Studcast, Super Studcast number 17, parts one and two are now available with Jimmy Golden. This is a fun and historic series of episodes. You get some really funny stories. You also get some true wrestling history. Over three hours plus are available right now for patrons of the Studcast. Only $2.99. Gets you in the door. It's the best deal in wrestling. TNstud.com or Patreon.com slash Studcast. Check out these shows today. But when it comes to the Studcast, Ron, where are we going next week? Well, I mean, we've really got a lot happening, man. Uh, uh, this this Southeastern promotion is really, it's taken me to my limits in a lot of different directions. And we're going to cover two more Knoxville cards before the third big Coliseum show of Sunday, April 27th. Uh, both of those April shows on the 18th and the 25th are very unusual and have matches that lead to the Coliseum show. They are built around the Coliseum show. And going to those cards plants you in that Coliseum if you're a wrestling fan. Uh, I can tell fans now that the next Coliseum show will include a first-ever match in Knoxville for the Mongolian Stomper. And it also will include the first time ever there for a brother of the world champion that night. It's going to be on that card. It's going to be Jerry Briscoe. So it's, and, and it will also be my brother's. Robert Fuller's first appearance since I came to Knoxville uh, on the Coliseum show. So, and we're going to also go back to Memphis for an unprecedented two world title matches with Jack Briscoe in 14 days in the same city. And if you add the totals of these two world championship matches uh, to the three that stood, that went before them, we're going to draw 53,000 fans in five nights at the uh, Mid-South Coliseum. And, uh, and then finally, I'm going to get that card from the, that call from the Knoxville television station. Uh, and we're going to talk wrestling to the big boys. Ron Fuller Studcast is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. For the Tennessee Stud Ron Fuller, I'm the great Brian Last. The story continues next week.